All right, autoimmune diseases. Uh, if, if I were your doctor and I had a chance to talk to you, you know, these are the things that I would like to say to you. And, you know, these are the things I'd hope your own doctor would tell you in terms of these various problems that so many people have. And the one we're going to talk about is autoimmune diseases. You know, I've known about autoimmune diseases for, for a long time. And uh, I, I would say I probably learned about it in junior high. Certainly in high school, I heard about autoimmune diseases. And what I remember is that the body attacks itself. Auto, auto, the, uh, the autoimmunity, the body attacks itself. And I kept thinking to myself, why, why would the body be so stupid? as to attack itself. Well, let's see if we can figure out why the body would do that, why the body would attack itself. But there's uh, you know, some general concepts that I want you to understand. First of all, I want you to know this is a disease of the entire body, you know, all, all the way from your toenail beds to your hair follicles. It, it affects everything, your skin, your balls, your joints, Every cell in your body is affected by what's going on here. And that's of course manifested in a whole slew of diseases that you thought maybe were unrelated, but they're all related. These are diseases where the body attacks itself like Addison's disease, where the body attacks the adrenal glands, alopecia, where it attacks the hair follicles. Ankylosing spondylitis is a kind of arthritis. Crohn's disease affects the bowels. Dermatomyositis is like it sounds. It's attacking the skin and the muscles. Diabetes attacks the pancreas. Inflammatory arthritis attacks the joints, et cetera. Lupus attacks the joints. Multiple sclerosis attacks the brain. Myasthenia gravis attacks the nerve end plates. End, end plates. Oh, I could go on. Let me go on. Pernicious anemia, that's where it attacks the stomach. Polymyositis, again, attacking the bones and the muscles. Psoriasis attacks the skin and the joints. And then you have psoriatic arthritis there, attacks the cartilage. And you have chondrochondritis, attacks the uh, connective tissue. You have scleroderma, attacks the thyroid, and you get low thyroid, you get hypothyroidism. You've heard about it, you've heard of autoimmune thyroiditis. That's what the doctor tells you you have. Vitiligo is what attacks the pigment cells of your skin. Every, I just want you to think about this. This is going on every place in your body. And it's probably going, uh, uh, it's going on with everybody who eats the risk Western diet to a certain degree. It just hasn't gotten to the point where it's causing you disability and significant symptoms like pain that you seek out the doctor. But this is going on inside of you now to understand what's going on as far as autoimmune disease. Why would the body attack itself? Well, you got to be patient with me on this particular slide. This is going to be the difficult part of the lecture. The, the underlying concept that eventually you need to understand, and I will tell you it many, many times as we go through the lecture, you under, need to understand this basic concept is we eat food. Well, when we eat plant foods, they're different than animal foods. So you don't get this kind of autoimmune reaction with plant foods because we're not plants, we're animals. So when we eat animal foods, uh, be they secretions of animals such as dairy products or parts of animals such as their thyroid glands or their muscles, what happens is this food goes into the intestinal tract where it's supposed to be broken down by various enzyme systems. It's supposed to be broken down into individual components that are not troublesome at all, but sometimes indigestion is incomplete. And as a result, uh, intact proteins persist and that's okay as long as they stay in the bowel but they don't what happens is people develop a leaky gut which is the second phase that we're talking about here and these intact proteins they go from the bowel into the bloodstream and they're not supposed to be in the bloodstream you've got you've got milk protein you've got cow butt protein you've got pig thyroid protein floating around your bloodstream now and the body thinks this is a virus or a bacteria or some kind of uh, invading organism. You know, cow and pig are not supposed to be inside your bloodstream. So the body makes antibodies against these foreign invaders. But the problem comes in in the fact that we have similar proteins on our various body tissues. And so the body appropriately makes, using its lymphocytes, white blood cells, 
it appropriately makes antibodies which attack the food protein, but these antibodies are not specific. They'll also attack similar proteins on your tissue parts and your skin in your pigment glands, on your pancreas, in your joints. It's called molecular mimicry, molecular mimicry. Okay, to uh, produce a leaky gut, you can do it in a couple of ways. Uh, one way you can do it is you can damage the gut by consuming wheat, barley, and rye. And how often does that happen? Well, it may happen in a lot of people. Uh, there is uh, some research in my distant past that tells me that if you eat as much as two pounds of bread a day, uh, you'll get into a glut gluten challenge, you know, challenged by gluten proteins, significant enough to start changing the ball and to start making it kind of leaky. But there are some people who are very sensitive to a leaky gut and the extreme of this is people who have celiac disease. Now, the other way that you can make the gut leaky is by, uh, by changing the microbiome. You've heard so much about this. These are the bacteria that live in your bowel. If you make them so wrong that the intestinal tract can't keep its integrity because the wrong organisms are living in it, what happens is you develop a leaky gut. So you have, uh, with, with celiac disease, here's your normal intestinal border. You see all those spikes sticking up there? Uh, those spikes increase the digestive service surface of your bowel. Well, when you consume wheat, barley, and rye, uh, particularly in sensitive people, people who have a tendency towards celiac disease, what happens is this brush border, these spikes, they get knocked down and the gut becomes damaged and it becomes leaky. And as a result, the intact proteins can get through into the system. All kinds of diseases are associated with people who have celiac disease like various autoimmune diseases, which we're gonna talk about during this entire lecture. I've listed all of these for you, but there are also non-autoimmune diseases that occur more frequently because you have all of this, this foreign protein floating around your bloodstream. You get lymphomas and other kinds of cancers. You lose bone, you have problems with your teeth, you have anemias, infertility, all kinds of difficulties occur. This is a major blow to the system to have the gut not be any longer intact. These are the, uh, the changes that occur when uh, your bowel becomes leaky due to dysbiosis, which is the wrong bacteria growing in the bowel. It's animal proteins. And you can look up the kind of bacteria that grow in the bowel when you eat animal proteins. And uh, these are the ones that are unhealthy and they cause the intestinal tract to be leaky. When you eat agrarian or plant agrarian type diet or plant-based or starch-based diet, then you grow healthy bacteria that keep the intestinal tract intact. Now, some interesting things I just wanna tell you about your bowel is, is the microbes living in your intestine, your large intestine, this is just like eight feet of organ you have 10 times more cells due to microbes, organisms, bacteria, viruses, 10 times more cells than are in your entire body. 150 times more genes. You have a thousand different species of little guys living in your intestinal tract. You can change your intestinal flora within 24 hours of changing your diet. And through a lifetime, 60 tons of food pass through that intestinal tract. Uh, I bet you always wanted to know that. Uh, consuming these animal foods causes another toxic reaction. It's due to uh, uh, the sulfur containing amino acids that you eat, which causes a dysbiosis. And this is related to the microbiome also, and that is when you eat sulfur containing foods. These would be your proteins. Uh, there are certain proteins uh, that contain amino acids that uh, are made up of sulfur compounds, like methionine is one of them. And if you look at the, uh, the amount of sulfur you consume, which is toxic to the intestinal tract is hydrogen sulfide, which causes this dysbiosis, which causes the gut to be leaky. You find that if you compare beef to pinto beans, same amount of calories, same amount of protein, you have four times more sulfur containing amino acids in beef that you do pinto beans. Eggs, four times more than corn. Cheddar cheese, five times more than white potatoes. 
And speaking of cheddar cheese, have you heard about cutting the cheese? Yeah, it's the, 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 the hydrogen sulfide that stinks so bad. It's the rotten egg smell. Chicken seven times more than rice and tuna 12 times more than sweet potatoes. So you create this dysbiosis. As a result, what happens is the lymphocytes, which is this big green guy here, it makes antibodies that go out and, and attack the foreign proteins that come into the system. It in its natural state should be looking for viruses, bacteria, you know, prions. It should be looking for parasites. But in this case, what happens is just like a virus, just like a, a bacteria, foreign proteins get in by way of the food. And so the body ends up attacking these foreign proteins, like in the case of beef, the lymphocytes attack the beef protein, which ends up attacking you or cow's milk protein. It's looking for a foreign substance, a virus, et cetera. Well, it does find the virus. It does find the bacteria. It does find the beef protein. It does find the gluten. It does find the uh, casein that's found in milk protein. It does find these things and the lymphocytes make antibodies, which are directed in this case towards cow protein, but also attack people. Mimicry is an evolved resemblance between an organism and another object, often an organism of another species. Molecular mimicry, it's called, you can look it up. Mimicry is copy. The body's looking for an invading substance and it finds you. Uh, let's take, for example, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay? Hashimoto, Hashimoto discovered this in the um, early 19th century. He was a Japanese scientist. So we call it Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Your doctor calls it autoimmune thyroiditis. It's where the body attacks itself. It attacks the thyroid gland. Now, why do you think the body would attack the thyroid gland? Well, maybe it gets, it becomes in contact with foreign thyroid glands. How do you come in contact with foreign thyroid glands? Well, <laughs> when they slaughter the pig and the cow, you think they waste the thyroid glands? Of course not, they turn them into hot dogs, into sausages. So you end up eating these foreign thyroid glands, pig, cow, thyroid gland, and the body makes antibodies to these foreign thyroid glands, but the antibodies made are not so specific that they don't end up attacking your own thyroid tissue. And you end up destroying your thyroid tissue. About 30, 40% of, of women in their 40s uh, develop thyroid conditions, it's, it's, it's quite common. Uh, another way that uh, these antibodies and proteins cause problems is by forming what we call antigen antibody complexes. Okay, you see these, uh, uh, th these large conglomerates of, of antibodies and you see the food protein and you see they form large aggregates and these large aggregates, they get stuck in the vessel walls and they get stuck in small blood vessels, particularly in the kidneys and in the skin. And some of the manifestations of autoimmune diseases have to do with these, these complexes. The well, first thing I wanna establish for you, after I've established the fact that this affects your entire body, you know, there's not a space on the body that isn't, that is immune to being attacked by your own self. I want you to know that the diseases that we're talking about, the autoimmune diseases are, are confined primarily to developed countries where they eat the rich Western diet based upon animal foods, where they've given up their traditional starch-based diet. And so I'm gonna run through quickly some, uh, some maps for you. And what you would notice if you have the time to look at it, and maybe you'll go back and you'll look at this lecture and you'll see, you'll see the, the keys and you'll see the different uh, the different countries and the incidence of disease, but you'll have to have a little faith that I'm reading these correctly for you. You see, for example, meat consumption is high in developed countries like Europe, the United States, Canada, South America, Brazil, Argentina, biggest consumer of beef in the world is in Argentina. And of course, in Australia, you see milk consumption, a similar worldwide distribution. Okay, the animal products is what we're looking at. You'll see if you lay over the incidence of disease in these two patterns, consumption of meat and dairy, you'll find a direct correlation. 
the lighter red and orange ones are the ones that have most of the diseases of type one diabetes. And you see they're in the developed countries, multiple sclerosis again in the developed countries, lupus, lupus, so lupus was unknown in Africa. Prior to 1960, there were no cases of lupus in Africa before 1960. In the United States, where we have a lot of people who have their origins distant from Africa, in other words, our African Americans are blacks, they have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation in the United States. So how did that happen? We went from a population where no lupus was described before 1960 to a different country where people eat a different diet and they have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation. They didn't change their race. Uh, they didn't get, uh, they didn't you know, change their genetics. It just was, they changed their food, that's it. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see the same thing. We're gonna be talking about these different conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, hypothyroidism. I just talked to you about the thyroid gland. It's common where people eat a lot of pork, a lot of beef, they eat a lot of thyroid glands and chronic kidney disease. Likewise, it forms the same pattern. In other words, we're talking again about diseases of, of affluence, of, of Western living. That's what we're talking about. We could be talking about heart disease, breast cancer, et cetera, type two diabetes. But in this case, we're talking about autoimmune diseases following the same pattern. You should understand the underlying common denominator, which is the food. Schizophrenia, same type of relationship worldwide. It's common in countries that eat the rich Western diet. All right, let's take a look at one of these diseases. Let's take a look at uh, type one diabetes. This is also referred to as childhood diabetes. And this is the classic autoimmune disease. Well, we've known about this being an autoimmune disease for a half a century. And I don't know of any doctor who talks otherwise than why do you get type one diabetes where the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin is hampered or stopped completely, the doctors will tell you it's the body attacking itself. It's an autoimmune disease. I don't know of any physician who talks otherwise. Everybody knows this. So what happens is in normal cells, you have uh, insulin receptors, which are kind of the Ys that you see sticking in the cells. You find the keys, which are insulin sticking in the cells in normal cells. You got plenty of insulin. And as a result, the blood sugar gets into the cells normally as they should. But in type one diabetes, you don't have any insulin. So even though you have normal receptors, the insulin is gone. And so the sugar can't get into the cells. We talked about this during the lecture on diabetes. I don't need to go forward with it in greater detail for you, except for you to understand is there little, there's little or no insulin in the body in type one diabetes because the pancreas has been injured. And what happens is the body consumes foods. In this case, we're talking about milk. In this case, we're talking about the beta casein protein in milk. In this case, we're talking about the discovery back in 1992 that this was the culprit what happens is by consuming milk products, you end up making antibodies, which not only attack the milk, but also attack the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. They're called the beta cells. And it takes about, uh, about three to seven years to destroy all the cells in the pancreas. And you have no more insulin producing cells in the pancreas. And then you have what we call type one diabetes. And we worked that out a long time ago, 1992. The 17 amino acids, which are similar between cow's milk protein and the surface cells of the pancreas, the 17 amino acids were discovered and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992. Everybody should know this. How about multiple sclerosis? Let's take a, little, a few minutes on this because I've spent a lot of my uh, career dealing with MS patients and We've done a study on multiple sclerosis. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of extra time on this autoimmune disease. Ah, oh, one of my big interests in multiple sclerosis and my first love in life when I was about 11 years old was Annette Funicello. I'm like, come on guys, 
If you're my age, you know you fell in love with Annette. Well, she died of multiple sclerosis in 2013. And that, I guess maybe that's part of the stimulus I have for being interested in multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, uh, this means multiple scars. You see here pictures of the brain. You see those little white blotches there, those are scars. That's what multiple sclerosis refers to as scars. What happens is the body attacks the nervous system. The nervous system gets inflamed, just like the arteries we talked about a few days ago, they get inflamed by the attack. And as a result, they develop inflammatory reactions, which eventually end up in scar tissue. This is dead tissue, scar tissue is. And what you're looking at is old scars. But of course, the more old scars you have, the more likely it is you have severe brain damage. And where these scars occur, it's, it's a kind of a classic way of uh, diagnosing multiple sclerosis is these scars makes no sense at all. They occur randomly. Uh, just like if you were to put a blindfold on and take a gun with your eyes closed and shoot it at somebody, it would randomly knock out different areas of the body. Well, so it is with multiple sclerosis. There's, there's no prediction as to where the inflammation, the damage and the scar tissues will occur. So one day you may wake up blind. The next day you wake up and you can't uh, work your bladder. And a few weeks later, you, the bowels don't work. And a little while later, one of your legs doesn't move. It's like a gunshot wound to your body, random. That's how you diagnose this disease. Well, if you follow the traditional Western diet, I have to tell you, you're not gonna do too well. And you know, many of my colleagues and neurologists I deal with, they don't like this information. And that's why I've provided for you six scientific papers. So you can look up whether or not my statement is true. And that is, even with the use of the most modern medications costing, I mean, just for the drug, $70,000 a year, the future prognosis is dismal with half of the patients afflicted with MS being unable to walk unassisted, bedridden, wheelchair bound or dead within 10 years. This is a serious disease. And there's no reason to believe that the modern medicines that you see advertised on cable news will change, will change the day you die. They brag about changes in disability, but they're minor. Believe it, they're tiny and they're questionable, but that's their bragging rights these days is they change the disability score, but not in much by folks, not much. In other words, you ought to be darn right stimulated to learn what causes this disease and to deal with it. One of the explanations for why people get MS is because they don't have enough vitamin D. There have been research projects. There are doctors who treat people with multiple sclerosis with vitamin D. Where did they get that idea that vitamin D caused MS? Well, what you do is you look at the worldwide map and you find out where multiple sclerosis is common or where it's rare, where it's common is, is uh, at greater latitudes, where it's rare is around the equator. Well, around the equator, you have lots of sunshine. As you move north and south, the amount of sunshine decreases. And so therefore the vitamin D production decreases, right? That, that, that's, that's common. Changes sunlight, you expect that, but you know what, this correlation is not cause and effect. This is a confounding correlation because something else happens as you move away from the equator. What you do is you change your diet. The people around the equator still eat a plant food-based diet, a starch-based diets. And as they move away from the equator, they consume more animal foods, more dairy, more meat, et cetera. And you'll see this with heart disease and many other common problems that we have is people say, well, it's lack of vitamin D. They don't tell you to get more sunshine. They tell you to take vitamin D pills or shots and get lots of tests, which fits in well with the business. Uh, it's not due to sunshines, folks. All right, so to develop multiple sclerosis, you need to do one extra step. In addition to developing a leaky gut, remember the gut leaks and so intact proteins go through from the intestinal tract into the bloodstream. They leak through the gut wall, all right? And now you have, uh, you have uh, the foreign proteins floating around in the bloodstream. You have to get by one more barrier. The nervous system has an extra barrier and that barrier is called a blood brain barrier. 
So once the lymphocytes get activated and are making antibodies, what happens is they, they're confined to the circulatory system, they're confined to the blood vessel system, and they have to get through what we call the blood-brain barrier to get into the central nervous system where they can attack the myelin sheets of the nervous system. And that's what happens. You attack the myelin sheets of the nervous system. Uh, Dr. Roy Swank, I want to introduce you to him now. He's one of my mentors. And I knew Dr. Swank quite well. Personally, I knew him. He ran two programs at St. Lita Hospital with MS patients that were his. And the uh, St. Helena Hospital was uh, where I ran my, my program, the McDougal program for 16 years. So Dr. Swank ran a couple of programs with me at St. Helena Hospital. Dr. Swank and I had an official legal agreement for me to continue on with this work. And that's one of the reasons I'm really, really happy to present Dr. Swank to you as somebody who's dealt with one of the most serious autoimmune diseases which should have made a bigger impression than he has. Dr. Swank, in a book that he wrote that I had a copy of in 1959, he knew, he knew the rich Western diet was the problem. He said, uh, gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases, you know, like heart disease and cancer and diabetes and so on, have been linked to the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying to dig your grave with your teeth probably has its origins in antiquity but in the prosperous areas of Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. 1959, I was, I was what, 14 years old at that time. Uh, Dr. Swank, uh, he took care of a lot of MS patients. He's uh, published uh, 176 papers and many of them have to do with diet and MS. Dr. Swank was the head of neurology at Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland for 23 years. You know, for many people around the world, they consider Dr. Swank the father of multiple sclerosis, certainly when it comes to diet and multiple sclerosis. Well, Dr. Swank, he demonstrated this uh, damage to the blood brain barrier. In other words, once you get the activated lymphocytes, and once you get the antibodies produced in the bloodstream, they have to go through the blood brain barrier and get into the nervous system. And here he shows the, how this occurs. And he does it by, by taking and injecting little tiny microspheres into the blood vessel system. And you see how these little microspheres, they damage the, uh, the blood vessel. You can see the fluid leaking out into the brain tissue. This is the brain, okay? So you see the blood brain barrier being violated here. Because we became interested in fat in this disease, we started studying the effect of fat on the circulation. We were using dogs and humans and uh, hamsters at that time. And what we found was that uh, after three hours after a large butter fat meal, you find the red cells starting to clump up and in the hamster, you could, where we studied the live circulation, you could watch the circulation slowing down and sometimes stopping for a period. And so we began to think in terms that this abnormality in the plasma, which we had become suspicious of being present, we began to think that there must be something in the, which is missing in MS, or which is abnormal in MS, which prevents this clumping and that this clumping of MS causes damage to the capillary system of the brain. And this destroys what we know as the blood-brain barrier. And these are Dr. Swank's uh, photographs that he did in his laboratory. And you see the blood cells, they hit and they bounce off each other. That's before any kind of meal. And then what happens is this circumstance is uh, fat is fed, this happens to be an animal experiment, as fat is fed to this animal, and the fat coats the blood cells and causes them to aggregate into clumps. And this aggregation in the low blood supply and the low amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues destroys the blood-brain barrier. And that's an important component when it comes to developing multiple sclerosis because you need to get the attacking agents into the central nervous system floating around in the spinal fluid for you to do the damage. 
the blood flow finally returns about 10 to 12 hours later. You know, that's after a single high fat meal. And And we showed uh, a similar in, in people. This is work done by, well, it was done by several investigators in the 1960s. And uh, this particular experiment was done by a guy named Mike Freeman. And uh, what uh, Dr. Friedman did is he took healthy people, relatively healthy people. They were men, how healthy could they be in their forties? And uh, they set up a, a way that they could examine the blood vessels. And to do this, you look at the whites of the eyes the sclera of the eye. You see those pictures off to your right of the, of the whites of the eye. And that was set up with a, a microscope and they took some still pictures. And you see the, uh, the frame on your left, you see lots of blood vessels. Oh boy, oh boy. There you go. You see lots of blood vessels here, thick blood vessels and, and a, a real rich circulation. And then what uh, they do is they feed this man a diet, one meal that contains 67% of the calories as fat. And his particular meal happened to be two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter, one meal. And what happened is you see four hours later, the picture of the same area of the eye. Blood vessels has disappeared. The reason they've disappeared is because the capillaries are transparent. And the only reason you see the vessels is because of the red blood cells flowing through the vessels. And when you cause them to clump and stick, no blood flows through the vessels. And so they disappear. This happens throughout the entire body, not just in your eyes, it happens in your brain and your toes, every place. Anyway, just to summarize what happens here. And we have animal experiments that show that milk protein can cause this kind of reaction where the lymphocytes produce antibodies to milk protein, which attack the myelin sheaths, which are the coatings of your nerves and destroy the myelin sheaths. And as a consequence of destroying the sheaths, the nerves are destroyed and a person develops multiple sclerosis. So how about, uh, how about treating multiple sclerosis? I mean, I've told you some really negative things about this disease, and I'm gonna tell you some negative things about some other problems. What about treating multiple sclerosis? Well, Dr. Swank dedicated his career to treating multiple sclerosis. And uh, what he did was he used a low fat diet. Total fat intake was 40 to 50 grams compared to the American diet of 100 to 175 grams, particularly saturated fat. He got rid of all the animal fats in the diet of MS patients and no limit on starches, vegetables, and fruits. And what Dr. Swank found is he found, and we'll see his words, Dr. Swank found that a difference of eight grams of saturated fat intake daily resulted in a threefold increased chance of dying of multiple sclerosis. Kind of remember those numbers, eight grams of fat in experiments that lasted decades. Eight grams of fat increased the risk of dying by threefold. Here's eight grams of fat for you. An ounce of pork sausage, that's eight grams. You know, a, a, a hamburger, eight grams. I'm not, I'm not saying and, I'm saying or. A porterhouse steak, eight grams, you know, cheese very small plate, eight grams. In other words, pretty much everybody who has multiple sclerosis is now eating the West, rich Western diet. Anyway, Dr. Swank, he uh, applied therapy for people with multiple sclerosis by feeding them a low fat diet. And as I has mentioned to you, you know, I have a legal agreement to carry on his work. So you know how much I believe in his work. And plus, as I mentioned, we ran two programs, two Dr. Swank programs at my uh, clinic in in the Napa Valley at St. Lita Hospital. So we had a very close association. Uh, this is what he says about, about what will happen if you put somebody with multiple sclerosis on a healthy diet. He said that it uh, decreased by about 70% the first year, the number of attacks were reduced by about 70%. And then after the first year, there was continued improvement with 5% fewer attacks for the next two years. And then for 16 years of treatment of the low fat diet, the rate of new attacks was decreased by 95%. Yeah. 
The patients were first on diet beginning actually in December of 1948. And uh, as I saw patients they were added through the years. Uh, one of the first things we noticed was a marked decrease in the evasion per year per patient. <clears throat> During the first year, there was about a 70% reduction in exacerbations, and in the next two years, about 5% each. And we published our first paper long about this time, at which point there was an enormous decrease in exacerbation rate. We've continued to follow the diet for 16, I mean, follow the exacerbation rate for 16 years. Came down to a level which was about a reduction of at least 95% and stayed down there during the 16 years and has continued to be that way. So you have a rapid drop in exacerbation rate and uh, followed then by a very low level of, of exacerbation going on for years. Now, I, I had the chance to give the a keynote uh, speech uh, where the Multiple Sclerosis Society honored Dr. Swankin. I had a chance to meet about 100 of his uh, participants who've been with him 30 or 40 years. I met people who were in their 70s flying airplanes. You know, I met fully functional people who'd stopped this disease. You know, I asked Dr. Swank, how often do you find that changing to a low fat diet fails? He told me, well, maybe one in 200, maybe one in 500. Yeah, otherwise you could expect success. Dr. Swank told me about one of his visits to China. He was asked by the Chinese government to come over and look at their cases of multiple sclerosis. This was back in the, you know, before the 1980s, before the diet changed in China. And he said the Chinese government presented five patients to him. And he said, I don't think any of them had multiple sclerosis. Of course, now the Chinese have lots of multiple sclerosis because they switched to the Western diet. Uh, anyway, the question was, is can we make a difference? Uh, I tried to prove this, that we can make a difference. I did a study with Oregon Health and Science University on multiple sclerosis and using the McDougall diet. We got some very positive results. Uh, because randomization was so biased against us showing any benefits in terms of MS, we didn't show those benefits, but we did show some pretty remarkable things with MS patients. First of all, we showed that people would stick with the diet. 85% of the people stayed with the McDougall diet for a year. And the only interaction we had with them was teaching them the diet. We didn't have any other interaction, but once they learned it, they stuck with it. Why? Because they got such dramatic results and the food tasted good. That's why they stuck with it. And so you see the red is the control group up there and they stuck with their, their control diet, the Western diet, which was 40% fat. And you see that we put people in the program, they dropped their fat intake to around 10 to 15% and they maintained it for a year. That's pretty remarkable, don't you think? And at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, one year trial period, we are allowed to, the control group to join the program. That's why you see the mark drop in the red line that occurs at the end. Anyway, we, uh, oh, we, we showed some pretty remarkable things in this study, even though we didn't show everything that I'd hoped to. The uh, average weight loss was nearly 20 pounds a year. Average cholesterol drop was nearly 20 points. We reduced the blood insulin levels. We improved fatigue. And as I mentioned, we had tremendous adherence one of the studies we published out of this particular main study was the fact that about 80% of people with MS have such severe fatigue that they can't function at work and in family. They just are so tired. Well, we showed a dramatic improvement in fatigue levels that occurred almost overnight when people changed to a healthy diet. I had some personal conversation with Dr. Swank that I'd like to share with you now. One thing I asked him was why don't people comply uh, you know, with these recommendations, he said to me, he said, you know, most people in this country expect to be cured by a pill to have a cure that is almost instantaneous. With a low fat diet, the people actually have to work to get better and they have to cure themselves. He went on, he said, one problem is culture. We are a meat potato society. Most importantly, there's an economic problem 
there's really not much money in diet. So that's all from the here. Nutrition has not been taught in medical schools for many years, and it still isn't taught. Why no support from neurologists or the MS Society? Now, this is really telling. He says to me, as far as the MS Society is concerned, John, he says they don't mention it because they didn't discover it. It wasn't their research dollars that found this treatment, so they're not going to tell anybody. I discovered it in my small office here in the basement of the medical school. It's called NIH, not invented here. If it's not invented here, not a reason to tell you about it. it doesn't support our, our business. All right, the Arthritis Foundation, what do they say about treating another autoimmune disease? We're gonna leave MS now. We're gonna treat, uh, talk about arthritis. What do they say about, uh, about arthritis? And, uh, well, first of all, I, I have to tell you what we're talking about here is the pain in any joint. You know, you can get arthritis from, from injuring a joint. That's called arthritis. You can get arthritis from gout. You can get an infection in your joint. That would be arthritis too. But the kind of arthritis we're talking about is where the body attacks itself, an autoimmune disease. I got a brochure from the uh, Arthritis Foundation. It was unsolicited back in 1978. This was sent to me, the truth about diet and arthritis from the Arthritis Foundation. It's simply this, there's no special diet for arthritis. There's no specific food that has anything to do with causing it. And there's no specific diet will cure it. Well, even at that time, everybody knew that gout was incurable. It was essentially 100% of the time with diet, but they weren't talking about gout. They were talking about autoimmune inflammatory arthritis. Now, they went on to say food fanatics and peddlers of health and nature foods may tell you otherwise. They said this in the brochure. I could have been offended. Other doctors would take the attitude, well, you know, there's no reason to teach people anything about diet in terms of arthritis because it's been proven to not be of any value. And here is proof that it's been proven. I have this brochure from the Arthritis Foundation. Same thing with patients, just saying, let's hand them this brochure and they go, all oh, the authorities have spoken. I might as well give up. In 2014, the Arthritis Foundation, they changed their pitch a little bit. Well, there is no specific diet uh, that people with rheumatoid arthritis should follow. Researchers have identified certain foods that can help control inflammation. Many of them are found in the so-called Mediterranean diet. They're heading in the right direction, aren't they? Currently, 2020, the Arthritis Foundation says, the bottom line is you don't have to adopt an all or nothing attitude to receive the benefits of a mostly plant-based diet. Going vegan, or vegetarian doesn't have to be a full-time commitment. I mean, come on. They're telling you to do it and then they're telling you you can't. You don't have to. Well, you have to. It's gotta be 100% because these autoimmune diseases, they don't require much of the offending food to get you in trouble. This is an, auto, this is an allergic type reaction, an autoimmune reaction. I mean, it's like if you went to the dentist and you were allergic to penicillin, the dentist said, I'll just give you a little shot of penicillin. You're going to be a lot dead from the reaction. It doesn't take much. You can't do a little bit and get well with their message that they currently have out there, even though they're sending you in the right direction because the science is so overwhelming that rheumatoid arthritis is caused and cured by a change in diet that they can't deny it anymore, but they still tell you, you can't do it. Don't bother. Maybe what they think is a relieving guilt on your part, but what they're doing is they're condemning you. They're condemning you to a lifetime of disability and drugs. All right, you should take this serious. This is really serious because one of the earlier studies, and uh, there's no reason to believe it's changed at all these days, was published in 1987, where they looked at a large group of rheumatoid patients that were on the current therapies, the best therapies available. And ladies and gentlemen, we have all kinds of biologic and TNF inhibitors and all kinds of high class, very expensive monoclonal antibody type drugs. And there's no evidence that says that anything is different than what they found in 1987 and reported in the Lancet. 
and that is the use of gold, chloroquine, steroids, and in resistant cases, penicillin and cytotoxic drugs. By 20 years, 35% were dead. And another 25% were disabled. They were bedridden or wheelchair bound. In other words, if you listen to the Arthritis Foundation and your rheumatologist in most cases, there are some exceptions out there, you are condemned. Not only to the ravages of this disease, but to the toxicity and costs of the drugs, which are obscene. 20, 30, $40,000 a year just for the medication. Drugs that cause cancer, drugs that cause infections for a tiny little benefit at best. All right, so let's talk about the dietary issues when it comes to inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. These are the inflammatory arthritis as opposed to osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear arthritis and gout, which is due to you know eating a lot of uric acid, high rich foods. Let's talk about inflammatory arthritis for a minute. Uh, some researchers believe that rheumatoid arthritis did not exist anywhere in the world before 1800. These kinds of arthritis were rare to non-existent in Asian and African countries. And uh, as recently as 1957, no cases of rheumatoid arthritis could be found in Africa. And as of 1960, they found the first case of lupus in Africa. As I mentioned to you a couple of minutes ago, the African-Americans, the blacks in this country have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation. What happened? They changed their diet. And so here you see the low prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis in the Chinese, basically non-existent. And the same thing in Africa, rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, essentially non-existent. And then they started treating people. Uh, this is an effort that started out with single patients that were reported in the scientific literature that would just occasionally came up in articles like the British Medical Journal. They talk about a case report of somebody that cured themselves by changing their diet. I, you know, this goes back a ways. This goes back 40, 50 years. But I want to tell you where we started an occasional case came out. And here's a case published in, uh, in uh, the Annals of Arthritis and Rheumatism. Very, very important journal for arthritis doctors and uh, what they find is that uh, they had 26 patients in the study and they improved with the change in diet. This is the classic study that was published in the British Medical, or excuse me, in the Lancet, a controlled trial of fasting, a one-year vegetarian diet with rheumatoid arthritis. Fasting, it was actually a juice fast, but again, they eliminated all dairy, all meat, et cetera. At the end of a week, all the patients showed improvement. At the end of a year and two years, those who stuck with the diet showed improvement, dramatic improvement. Some of them you could only call cure. And we studied, published a study back uh, a few years ago, 2002. So what would that be almost 40 years ago? We published a study on the dietary treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And we showed benefits even back then. Since then, there have been a few attempts to, to give people the advantage of a healthy diet. Study published in rheumatology in 2001, a, a vegan diet without wheat, barley, and rye, improved arthritis patients. And then we just have a study. Well, let's see what this one said. The one year effects of a vegan diet, 22% of the vegan patients and 25 on a non-vegan diet for nine months. But of the patients who followed the vegan diet, they got better. You know, nine of the patients uh, got better. whereas very few of them got better on the non-vegan diet. In a study just published, the improvement of inflammatory pain after three months of exclusion diet of rheumatoid arthritis, they excluded meat and gluten and lactose and just for three months and they showed dramatic improvement. What, what should you expect? What you should expect and what my experience has been is that within four to seven days, you should see four to seven days, you should experience improvement. It takes four to seven days to get the bad food out of the gut. You shouldn't expect improvement for, for fewer than four to seven days. 
and then things start to get better. And if you're not all better in four months, then you're likely not going to get any better. But almost everybody gets dramatically better with the dietary change that I recommend within four months, which you can't be as unrealistic. You can't expect your crooked joints to straighten out. All you can expect is no further attacks. Uh, lupus, there's a uh, study published on lupus, which is a similar disease. It's one of the inflammatory arthritis. And uh, they gave up dairy. Those who gave up dairy did the best as far as improvement goes. Uh, and it's not just the, the, you know, the crippling hot red joint type of uh, attack that occurs. There's a milder form of uh, autoimmune disease, uh, which attacks the muscles and the joints and the tendons. And it's not bad enough to call it an arthritis, it's not bad enough to label it rheumatoid or lupus, but we label it fibromyalgia, which used to be a problem that almost everybody seemed to suffer back 10 years ago and fibromyalgia again, treated with a healthy diet, you get tremendous improvement. I'm trying to show you there's a reason for you to look other in other directions for help. And I can share with you my experience was, which, which, is, which says that you should expect to get dramatically better. All right, all kinds of problems. As I mentioned to you, this attack on your body occurs from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And these were the diseases that I told you, every part of the body including nonspecific inflammation like fibromyalgia. It's every place. Let's take a look at some of the other autoimmune diseases that have been treated with a healthy diet. Here's one where they treated ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And 15 out of 16 patients uh, were essentially cured. They got a remission. And when they talk about their semi-vegetarian diet, I give you a picture of it down there in the left-hand corner. What you see is this is a vegan diet. They call it a semi-vegetarian diet, but it's a vegan diet. And here you have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is, I know you wouldn't think about it. It's a, uh, they consider it a psychiatric disease, but there's been considerable evidence that says this is another autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself. A couple of papers that I'd like you to read for those of you interested in schizophrenia and it's a variant, which is called autism. And they're down in the bottom left-hand corner. You get these two papers and you'll see the connection between diet and these two conditions. But there are also other modern research articles published right now, you know, last year, this year, a couple of years ago, saying that uh, schizophrenia, this psychiatric illness is caused by an autoimmune reaction that has its basis in the gut. You know, one explanation that I had that maybe made a little bit of sense to me as to what happens in a patient who has schizophrenia is they have a, a lot of delusions, a lot of visuals, a lot of hearing distortions. And the comparison that I was given was this is like somebody on hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. And uh, what is explained is that uh, these antigen antibody complexes that are formed have actual neuropsychiatric capabilities, which causes you to have these kind of reactions that are similar to hallucinogenics. The antigen antibody complex is somehow lodged in the brain or produces some subchemicals that give you this kind of reaction. Uh, cow's milk, published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a beautiful, beautiful paper. Got no attention. But what they did is they looked at, uh, at adults and children who had nephrotic syndrome, which is where the kidneys are inflamed and you're about to end up on a dialysis machine. They took uh, four of the participants, which happened to be children and they biopsied their kidneys. And you see here in the frame that is labeled A, B and C, you can see the, the attack of the kidney tissues by antibodies that were created by an initial reaction with cow's milk. 
In other words, what happens is the cow's milk got through the gut wall into the bloodstream where it shouldn't have been and the body made antibodies that now cross react through molecular mimicry with the kidney tissues. And so not only did the antibodies attack the milk protein, but you can see them laid all over the kidney tissues in this, uh, these immunofluorescence pictures. So interesting, they followed up on these kids, uh, four of the kids, who they found the circulating antibodies in their bloodstream and the changes in their kidneys that you see here. And they took them off the milk. And all four of them went through remission. Why isn't it that everybody isn't told this? Why isn't it that every pediatrician and every pediatrician deals with children who have kidney problems? Why aren't they being told about this crucial research? You know, these, these children were destined to end up on a dialysis machine to have a kidney transplant and or to be dead and sick. All right, so how do I approach uh, people who have autoimmune diseases? Well, first of all, I feed them the basic diet and most people get well with the basic diet. If you go to our website, drmcdougall.com, this is free. You know, there's a whole 12 day program. You can do it. Many people do it. Thousands of people have done it. Of course, we would encourage you to look into our 12 day internet program, which is you know, the easiest way, the best way to ensure success. And we run this uh, 12 day program every month. Uh, and it's done over the internet. We have tremendous support in your home, et cetera. But hey folks, it's free. It's on the website. We have over 4,000 recipes published in the McDougall Cookbook app, which has 1,000 recipes and 13 national best-selling books on the website. And they're free, 4,000 recipes. The next step that I take is I put people on a gluten-free diet. And you say, well, how can you do that on the McDougall diet? Well, I just avoid the high gluten starches. That's all. Which would be wheat, barley, and rye, and some of their subvariants. That's what you have to avoid. These are the high gluten foods, but there are all kinds of starches that you could be choosing that have low levels of this glycoprotein, this gluten, such as corn and millet and quinoa and rice and wild rice and any of your root vegetables, your legumes all your green and yellow vegetables. It's no problem at all following a gluten-free diet when you're on the McDougall diet. You ought to do it. You should do it if you're not getting well and you have any of these inflammatory problems, any of these autoimmune diseases. You need to make this change as a second step. I know a lot of you out there have made the change as a first step when you weren't even sick from any gluten problems. You know, you go to the grocery store and about 40% of the products in a grocery store are sold to you as being gluten-free. So what? So what? I mean, only 1% of the population at most, at most has celiac disease or dermatitis hepatiformis, which is the skin condition related to wheat, barley, and rye. You know, one out of 100 people, maybe one out of 250, yet they're, they're, uh, they're marketing to 40% of the people at least who are looking to gluten-free products. You're not gonna get better. Your attention is spent in the wrong direction. This is a, a disastrous distraction for you to be interested in a gluten-free diet if you don't have de definite problems related to gluten. And plus the poor folks that really do have celiac disease and get really sick if they end up having wheat, barley, and rye, they're, they're, they're served poorly too by this general message that everybody's sick due to gluten. You know, here you have a situation where the person with real celiac disease goes to a restaurant, orders a meal without any croutons or breads or whatever, and the waiter comes out and brings a soup that has croutons all over it. And the customer says, well, didn't I tell you I have celiac disease? You know, I'll end up vomiting, I'll get sick, I'll have, have diarrhea. I'll, you know, you'll have to call the ambulance if I eat that meal. And the waiter says, you know, the last 40 people who were in here that told me they were gluten sensitive. I gave them the 
the soup with the croutons. They didn't complain. We need to get this straightened out. Okay, the next step is to try the elimination diet, which is described in detail in my May 2014 newsletter, which by the way, also describes my May 2014 newsletter. It describes 10 cases of severe, debilitating, potentially deadly inflammatory arthritis. It's a great newsletter, but it also goes into the, the elimination diet, which is the foods that people are least likely to react to. All right, so your first step in dealing with these autoimmune diseases is you stop putting animal proteins in the gut. Because as I mentioned to you, we're animals, and so the cross-reaction is very easy between animal foods and us as animals. Whereas plant, their proteins, their parts are so different. They're in a whole different kingdom. They're in the plant kingdom. We're in the animal kingdom. So that even if plant proteins get into the bloodstream, and the body makes antibodies to them, they're not gonna find any similar proteins on your body. All right, well, you know, considering all possibilities, uh, occasionally somebody has to be on a, a much more restrictive diet, which will attend to the bowel integrity, cure the leaky gut, give you the minimum amount of offending proteins, and a diet that is most likely to cause you to get well. It's called the elimination diet. And I've used this for 40 years. And there are people occasionally who have to do this. Elimination diet, you have uh, brown rice, puffed rice, sweet potatoes, tapioca, taro. That's your starch. Or those are the starches you're least likely to, least likely to react to. And then you have non-starchy green and yellow vegetables, all thoroughly cooked. All cook. Why do you cook them? You cook everything because it denatures the protein and makes them less likely to you, for you to react to them. And you can have fruits, a couple of fruits that I just added here, which, you know, I'm the author of the elimination diet. Can I, so I can do this. I added it to the fruit category and I almost added it to the starch category is jackfruit and breadfruit, which is about 93, 94% carbohydrate, only about 3% protein. And oh, you can make some tasty dishes out of jackfruit. And that's why I was tempted to make it a starch, but it's really a fruit. One last thing as far as you're changing your diet and trying to get well, I know that you heard the word vegan and you heard the word vegetarian. It's not enough. You know, vegetarians, they often eat uh, dairy and egg products and they could even be, uh, be fish eaters, pesco vegetarians. Poyo vegetarians that eat chicken. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, you can't do that. You're not going to get well. And when I mentioned vegan or vegetarian diet, many of you don't understand the important impact of oil. Oil will keep you sick. It, it somehow injures the gut or injures the immune system to the point where you just don't get well. And for example, in this particular study where they put people for a week on a water fast and they got well. And then they put them on a diet, a vegan diet that was 42% fat. And almost all of them got sick again, except for those with psori psoriasis. They seem, I don't know why they seem to stay well. You can't add the vegetable oils to the diet. You can't get to this stage of solving your problems and then ruin it by putting corn oil or safflower oil or canola oil or flaxseed oil or any kind of oils over the top of it because you'll ruin it and you'll ruin the benefits. The last step would be for you to go to the ultimate elimination diet. And I do this with occasional persons, you know, maybe one out of every 300 people. I'll get to an insolvable situation. Either I can't get them to change their diet or somehow or another, I miss something. Well, I send them to the ultimate elimination experience. And it was convenient when we had our clinic in Santa Rosa because True North, which is a fasting center with great fame and deservedly so, was only about two city blocks from us in Santa Rosa, California. They have great doctors there, they have great care there. And if you can't get well with the recommendations that I gave to you, which is gonna be very rare, but this is the next step I'd offer you. But I have to point out to you that what they're going to do for you is only temporary. You can't water fast forever. You have to learn to eat. And of course, they teach you the McDougal diet when you leave. 
but for most people, you can skip the step of water fasting to search out your, your ways of being cured. For most of you, almost all of you. But those of you who need a little extra help, True North is there. All right, so you got a choice. Uh, you could look at your future and you could decide that you're not gonna suffer the drugs, the disabilities, the early death, the pain. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna fix the problem by dealing with the cause. The cause is the food. You fix the food, you'll stop attacking every single tissue in your body, all the way from the top of your scalp to the soles of your feet. Thank you. I'm Dr. John McDougall. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You can find me, of course, at drmcdougall.com.